Um, so what I present is joint work with my advisor, Didier Remy. Um, let's start with a little bit of motivation. Uh, so imagine that we are writing a program in a, a functional, statically typed programming language with algebraic data types, OCaml, for example, and that we wrote an evaluator for a very simple programming language or complex. So we have a constant, addition, multiplic uh, multiplication, and maybe some other things. We also wrote an evaluator because that's probably what we want to do. Uh, it's still very simple, but there can be a number of other cases. And we, we realized that we made a mistake when writing the type of expressions. For example, uh, we have a lot of binary operators, two, that's already a lot. And uh, we want to, uh, to factor them into a single constructor, for example, to implement uh, uh, transformations in a more simple way. Uh, so we can change our type. And now what happens to all the functions we have, we have already written? Well, what we would do as uh, programmers in a statically typed language is that we would copy the function or just add a new, uh, change the type annotation. And then we will, uh, we will look at all the occurrences that are pointed by the type checker, and we will fix them one by one. So that works quite well. We, we already have, we are quite lucky to have types to help us do that. Uh, but that's still a manual process. It may be, it may be quite long. Uh, we could introduce errors uh, while editing the file. Uh, for example, we could, I don't know, switch U and V. Uh, and the, the type checker might even miss some places where change is necessary. For example, if we exchange two fields with the same type, there's no way for the type checker to, to understand that we should have changed this part. Um, so what can, what can we do to improve, the, improve this situation? Um, uh, the thing that we are not exploiting is that in our, in our mental model of program modification, we, we know that there is a link between the old type and the new type. So what we want to do is to uh, keep track of this link while doing the modification uh, so that we don't miss any occurrence and we can exploit this information to do the transformation automatically. Uh, so we will use a restricted class of transformations uh, called ornaments introduced by, uh, by Connor McBride and he introduced the uh, the coherence property that we will use for lifting functions. It, it gives a, a sort of specification of the function that we would that we would want to produce. Uh, so there, there has been some uh, quite a bit of work uh, on ornaments. There is a, a work by Mac Bride and Pierre, and Pierre Dagan who continued uh, working on this. I actually started working uh, on ornaments with Pierre. Uh, there are also uh, some people at Oxford, I think, uh, Cohen Gibbons, that, uh, that did things on uh, using ornaments. Uh, in all these cases, this is uh, encoded in Agda. So this is a cool language. You can do a, a, a nice encoding with powerful dep dependent types. It's, it's great. Uh, but that, does, that doesn't work in ML. We don't have this, all the metaprogramming facilities given by dependent types. And so uh, we need to be, uh, well, we need to do things a bit differently. Um, so what we, what we do is that instead of encoding them, we define ornaments as a primitive concept. Uh, the correctness of a lifting is not an internal property anymore. So it was a, an equality in the type theory, and now it's something we, have, we know externally. Um, we want to do program transformation. So what we'll do is that we, we will restrict the transformation uh, to stick to the syntax. This is quite a reasonable uh, assumption. Uh, we don't want to change the functions too much. And if we have this and the coherence property, we can automate the lifting quite a lot. And uh, we prove uh, the correctness of our transformation uh, based on this process and this proof. So we, we built a, a prototype tool for, for lifting functions. Uh, that works on a, on a restricted subset of ML. I'll give an example. So uh, let's start again with our example. We have two types, uh, the old type, the new type. And instead of just replacing the definition and uh, trusting the type checker, 
uh, we will write, we will define an, uh, an ornament that describes the relation uh, between these two types. Um, so uh, this is an ornament OX from X to X prime. So it transforms constants to constants prime. And uh, if U uh, is transformed, is related to U prime V to V prime, then add of U and V is related to binary prime at prime, U prime V prime, etc. So uh, you can notice that we don't really want to use, we will never use u there and u prime there. So we can just collapse them. Uh, so we just use u and v. This is, uh, this is a more compact notation for the same thing. Um, so once we have defined this relation, uh, we, we can use it to list functions because now we have a specification. So we start with our code, and we write, uh, uh, we specify that we want eval prime to be a listing of eval, where the first argument has been transformed uh, using the ornament OXP, and the second argument is left uh, as is because it's in, in it's uh, integer, it's, it's good. So what does this mean? This means that if u and u prime are related by our relation OXP, uh, we want the evaluation of eval u. Uh, to be the same as the evaluation of u prime. Um, and so our tool will generate exactly this code without any more if, uh, any further effort. Uh, so it, it looks like la what we would have written manually. So what's good about this is that we have a clear specification of the, fun of the function we want. And we do know that the function we return respects this specification. Uh, in this case, we are lucky. Our relation is one to one, so the result is unique. Um, and so we uh, we have a, a painless way to refactor a huge, uh, potentially huge, huge program uh, for for such transformations. Um, uh, we can do uh, other things with with ornaments. Uh, for example, uh, this is a. This is quite new. Uh, uh, we have, uh, if we start with the type of lists, maybe in some parts of the programs, of the program, we only use lists with three elements, for example, to represent uh, vectors in space. Uh, and maybe uh, we are not really happy about this because we are missing an invariant in, in our types. And uh, the representation is not efficient at all. So we have three cons cells and then instead of uh, just a triple. So let's write uh, the type of homogeneous triple. And we, uh, we can define uh, the transformation from, li from list of three elements to triples. Uh, this should be triple uh, using an ornament. So the list of three elements is mapped to the triple. And uh, all other cases are mapped to the empty pattern. So this is an incomplete ornament. And we have uh, we have restricted the possible values. Uh, now, if we start with some some function operating on uh, on lists, uh, we can ask for it lift for its lifting to triples. Um, so what this will generate is uh, this. So what happens is that the, the map function uh, has been unfolded. To follow the, the transformation we did on uh, on triples uh, to to switch from from uh, from list to triples, uh, so did, uh, this is a bit obfuscated. We could automatically remove the noise and get this one. So this is the code. If if you want the user to edit the code afterwards, this is the code we want we want to have. Uh, we can probably trust a compiler to to compile the previous code to something equivalent to this, but. That's not good enough for, for programming. Um, so what's what's cool about this? Uh, we have uh, we started from an invariant that was already present in the code, but that was not apparent. And by by duplicating some code, uh, we have made it uh, obvious that the list we manipulate uh, are three elements long. Uh, this also allows a better representation, so we can use this for optimization. Uh, we could also use this for, uh, for optim optim optimizing general lists, for example, using special constructors for short lists. Uh, this would be something that we could uh, express in the same way. Um, 
another class of example with ornaments. Uh, this is actually an important thing of ornaments, and I haven't talked about. Uh, I haven't introduced it before in the presentation. Is that we can add data. For example, if we start with the type of natural numbers, uh, it looks quite close to the type of lists. So the only difference is that we have renamed the fields and we have some some new data there. And we can write an ornament that relates uh, natural numbers to lists. So uh, zero is nil, and the successor of a tail is counts of something in the tail where the tail has been transformed using the ornament. Uh, there's nothing surprising about this. Uh, what's different is that uh, the relation is not one-to-one not -one anymore, so we have uh, this pattern matches a lot of things. Uh, so what happens when we try to to transform a function. <coughs> so we start for, from addition. And uh, if we ask for its lifting, uh, we can imagine that it will give something that looks like append, because it's uh, roughly the code of append. So we ask for the lifting, and we get this code. Um, it's, it looks like we, what we want to have, except that there's some missing part there, because um, the ornament, do, uh, the coherence property doesn't specify anything about this uh, because it doesn't talk about the, the part that we added to the ornament. Uh, so what we have to do about this is that we have to specify a patch. Uh, this is something user provided that will give the additional information. Uh, here what we do is that we match an N that, that's a variable in scope for this, for this thing. And uh, we, we get the head of the list and, uh, and return it. Um, you can notice that uh, we, we are smart with uh, the transformations on patch. So instead of just inserting the patch there, which would create an apparently incomplete pattern matching, give, ton give tons of, of warning and be quite inefficient, uh, we can simplify it automatically uh, to, just, to just put X there. Uh, so here is for the examples. Uh, now the question is how to do this in a principled way. And for this, I would like to uh, to start by talking about something else. Uh, how, does, how does one write uh, modular code in, in ML? Uh, the idea is if we want to write code that, uh, that works on many data types, we can start by writing polymorphic code that abstracts over the details, and then we can provide uh, an implementation. For example, we do th this with functors, typically. Uh, so we give type and value arguments. A uh, good thing about this is that we can, if we want another implementation, we can just pa pass the new arguments. So we, we obtain a new code with different uh, implementation details. And we get a theorem for free that says that uh, as long as uh, A and B, the arguments are appropriately related, uh, if A and FB will, will behave the same up to the differences between A and B. Um, so that, that's cool, and we can't do that uh, because our base code is not abstract at all. So what we'll start by doing, because this, this looks like a good process that we would want to use, is that we, we will take our starting code and we will generalize it. So what we'll do is we, we will find the most general version in a, in a way that is independent of the ornament of the instantiation we will do later. And now we can find uh, an instantiation of this uh, most generic version with identity arguments that give back the, the base code or something equivalent. Uh, and uh, to, to generate uh, the final code, uh, we can just give the right arguments that will be inferred from the signatures given by the user and uh, obtain the lifted version. So that's getting a bit abstract. I'll give an example. So this is the generic version that corresponds to the function add. Um, what has changed, uh, in, uh, we, uh, we have added three arguments. And instead of matching directly on M, we ask for it to be projected to something that looks like uh, natural numbers. It's not exactly like natural numbers. And uh, instead of constructing uh, the successor, we use a, this injection function 
uh, that will do some that will do some transformations. Uh, for example, um, and uh, we we have a patch that will give the additional information. Uh, if we want to get the identity instantiation, uh, that's simple. We just have a patch that translates z to z prime uh, that re that adds or removes z prime as necessary. And the patch is not used, so we can put anything we want. And the add function we obtain there is equivalent uh, to uh, the add function we had at the start. If we want to get append, uh, we can invent uh, new arguments that will uh, dis this describe the ornament uh, between uh, NAT and list. And this is the patch that is given by the user. And so we get this function append. Um, that's almost good, except that uh, this is ugly code. Uh, we don't want to commit this uh, into into a repository. We don't want to co continue working on this code. We don't re even want to read it. Um, so we have to do something more. Uh, we have to do some simplifications on the code uh, that will give something that's nicer. Um, uh, so what we need to do is remove the uh, apply the, the new arguments and uh, inline them and and do this kind of thing. And so what we have is instead that uh, the base code is equivalent to the generic code applied to some arguments, the final code is equivalent to the generic code applied to some other arguments. Now, how do we, do we find the relation uh, between the, the base code and the, the generic code? We just need to prove that the arguments are related, and then the results are related, and if we gives the right relation here that will correspond to the to the ornament. Uh, we will know that this is the the relation, uh, the coherence relation we want. Uh, so um, one last thing that we are missing there is that it doesn't. Uh, you haven't seen it on the previous slides, but in fact, this encoding is not typeable in ML. Um, so we have to introduce some. I, uh, some uh, more richer language that has a form of dependent types, uh, lightweight dependent types, uh, that are used to uh, to type uh, our encoding. And uh, what we can do once we have done that, it's we, we can introduce some special applications and abstraction in this language uh, that we will color in blue and that will be uh, that we can guarantee are reduced. So we have a, a result that says that. Uh, if we have a well-typed term in, under some conditions, all uh, all blue things will be uh, will be removed by uh, by some reduction, uh, without uh, having to do any uh, a reduction of uh, ML uh, ML code. Uh, the simplification here does some other things. So it uses uh, the equalities that we can learn from pattern matching uh, to uh, to inline things, and that's why uh, the patch was transformed to X. Uh, and wh what you obtain is so a way to a principled way to get from some base code uh, to a uh, to a lifted version uh, with a process that we can prove is correct. Uh, now we can implement this. Uh, so we have a prototype that works on a small subset of OCaml and that precisely follows the process outlined here. Uh, it is available online with many more examples. Uh, there is something that I didn't talk about in uh, in this is that. Uh, well, the, there's the question of patches. Uh, uh, we consider that it's something that orthogonal, so we don't uh, find in patches is code inference, and uh, we are, it's not the kind of code inference we are interested in. Well, just one interesting note is that uh, when this might, uh, property based code inference might be the, uh, a quite robust way to specify patches. Uh, because we can just uh, write something that relies on the external uh, behavior of the function, and this one would be enough to uh, uh, to generate the function we want. Um, you should read our paper, so there is much more in it. Uh, we define the intermediate language uh, uh, with dependent types. Uh, we define conditions that, that guarantee that we can simplify this language back to ML. We precisely give the encoding of ornaments in uh, in this language. We define a logical relation on this language and an interpretation of ornaments in the uh, in this in this relation. Uh, we we give a formal description of the lifting and we put all this together to prove that uh, lifted term, terms are indeed related at the correct ornament. Um, 
So uh, we have a bit of, we have something that we would like to do from this. So uh, we would like to write a new implementation that supports most of OCaml and piggybacks on OCaml's type checker. Uh, this would allow us to run this uh, large scale program and so make it useful for for actual programmers. Uh, we would need support for GEDTs because GED, uh, adding an invariant in some, is something we can do with ornaments that we don't really treat here. Uh, there is a question of how to write robust patches, uh, so we have to, to consider this more. And uh, we are, our formal results uh, don't take effects into account. Uh, the implementation is correct with respect to, to effects, but that's not proved. Uh, but what we are happy about is that we have a principled way of transforming programs along ornaments. Uh, the process uh, uses uh, abstraction, then speci specialization. And uh, we think that's something that could be generalized to other transformations. Uh, uh, so we'll try to do something with this. Um, thank you. Hi, Ryan Newton, Indiana University. Uh, first of all, great talk. It's wonderful to see ornaments moving towards uh, practical usability in, in this way. Um, a couple questions. Uh, first, about expressiveness. Uh, from the talk, I couldn't see wit, what category of patches this works for. It looked like you wrote an arbitrary function for the patch. So for instance, could I convert a field that is a arbitrarily sized list to an array instead? Um, no. Um, so. As a class of transformations we are considering there uh, is transformations that can be described by some uh, mut uh, some mutually recursive functions that do pattern matching and don't have too much memory uh, roughly and we can't uh, delete information also that uh, that would be the ornamentation which could work by the same pro same process but uh, we haven't implemented Related to that, I was a little confused about the deployment model here. So I would never actually want to commit code with the lift keyword, right? This would be more of a command to my refactoring engine? Um, there are a few possible ways to do this. Uh, if you, um, so, uh, if you're doing refactoring, like going from X to X prime, you will probably want to throw away the old code and the lifting code and just keep the final code and commit it. If you are doing this for optimization, for example, uh, to speci specialize some program to uh, some functions to triples, you might want to keep the lifting instructions for the list library instead of committing a new version. So if you fix bug in the original, uh, you, you get the bug fixed in, the, uh, in your copy. Uh, so this depends on, your, on exactly what you want to do with them. Ah, thank you, that makes sense. Can you compose ornaments? Um, oh, that's a good question. There are, uh, can you compose ornaments? Uh, yes. So yes, we can compose ornaments. There are two compositions that I can. That are interesting. You can serially compose ornaments. So you do one ornamentation of one type, and then re-ornament the, the target type. So we can already do that. We just have to give two lifting instructions. Uh, maybe the an interesting case is, uh, is the pullback of two ornaments, where you, in, in one ornament, you, do, you add some data. In other, for example, you add an invariant, and you want to get an ornament that gives you the best of both worlds, so new data, new invariants. And you can combine uh, already existing liftings. Uh, you should be able to combine them without writing any additional thing, uh, any, any additional code. Uh, to work on the on this uh, this compose ornament, so that's probably the that's the most interesting composition I think, or at least that I can think of. I mean, the first one you didn't really answer because what I wanted to know is if you have two ornaments, do you get one ornament which represents the composition? Uh, yes, you should oh. have one ornament that represents the Too composition. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you.